Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is The West Walk, politics, perspectives, and players. Hundreds of Canadians around the world are being detained in foreign jails or held hostage, the victims of criminal or terrorist kidnappings. Behind the scenes and in the shadows, secretive members of Canada's security agencies work around the clock trying to secure their release. Andy Ellis was one of those people for 30 years. He worked on negotiating the release of Canadians in many high-profile cases, and he is the former assistant director for operations with CSIS, now working with Eventel in Toronto. Andy, how would you rate the government's performance on this file at this point in terms of dealing with the Canadians who have been detained? Well, it depends on how you look at it. I think if you talk about dealing with the Canadians that have been detained, I think they're doing the best they can given the circumstances. I think I would rate them less high in uh, managing this, you know, sort of over the longer term. Uh, this situation developed over a long time you know, a long period of time, and I think it could have been dealt with by having a policy in place some time ago. Uh, if you look at the way Huawei has been dealt with in other countries and the decision to allow them into the 5G network, for example, uh, it was done sort of as a group. And had we made the decision at that time uh, with the United States, Australia, the UK, New Zealand, and others, I don't think we would have stood out quite so much as we do now. Uh, and now with the arrest in Vancouver, uh, we've gotten ourselves into a very difficult situation. A lack of foresight before. So at this point, should the government be saying no to Huawei? I do. Uh, I think, you know, it would have been a lot easier to say no to Huawei some time ago. Uh, the difficult situation that we have here is, uh, the best way I can describe it, is people are being held hostage. Uh, people are being held hostage. Canadians are being held hostage in China. And it puts a different light on it. You now have to look at this as a... Uh, hostage negotiation, a very difficult diplomatic negotiation as opposed to a business decision that I think could have been made some time ago. Andy, you've negotiated behind the scenes with China in particular on the Kevin Garrett case. He was detained in China. He was accused of spying some similar circumstances. Based on that, what circumstances do you believe these Canadians are being held in now? Well, you know, it's, it's a jail in China. I, you know, it isn't uh, the Metro West Detention Center. It's kind of tough. Uh, you know, but by those standards, they would be, uh, there'd be, a, you know, foreigners being held. They'd be dealt with with a certain degree of kid gloves, I hope. That's normally the, the process because it is a diplomatic issue. You want to keep them safe and healthy. Uh, part of the job of the Canadian government is to make regular consular visits to make sure that they're okay. Uh, but, you know, as long as you're held in a Chinese institution, it's extraordinarily difficult on the people being held and, and probably equally or more difficult on their families. We've heard they're being questioned for up to four hours a day. And going back to when Kevin Garrett was held, he was kept in custody for about two years. Do you expect a similar timeline in this situation? I don't know what the timeline is, but it's not good. The, the situation has been allowed to get to this point. I, I honestly believe it could have been avoided. As I said, had decisions been made you know, on Huawei and 5G some time ago, I think we would have been able to sustain ourselves through the, through the arrests in, uh, in Vancouver a lot more uh, effectively. Uh, now it is into a very, very difficult situation and diplomacy uh, is slow and the legal process is slow. And you know, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is the Chinese government have a lot of influence over people that are held in jails in China. In this case, they're clearly trumped up charges. Uh, that's not the case in Canada. You know, by, by nature of our constitution, the executive branch and the legislative branch do not influence the ju judicial system. Thank God. Uh, but it puts us into a difficult position. The Chinese are expecting us to intercede and intervene, and we can't. And uh, as long as that continues, the same situation um, occurs in China. And they're playing exceptionally hardball. Given the situation right now, would you go to China? No. Absolutely not. And I think it's important that businesses, and that's part of what uh, my company does now, is businesses take a very, very serious look at the people who are traveling on their behalf. Because as I said, it's trumped up charges. They're grabbing people who have influence. They're grabbing people who, you know, if you're working for company X and it's very influential with the Canadian government and something happens to your employee, you're gonna put a lot of pressure on the government to resolve the situation. So it's a, it's a tenuous situation, to say the least. I certainly wouldn't go for, for pleasure. And uh, for business, until the situation is resolved, I would be very, very careful. 
Do you think the travel advisory that the government has issued right now adequately expresses the risk for Canadians? Um, yeah, I, I think it's carefully worded. Uh, I would, my, my best measure, I'd say it's okay. Uh, you know, we could talk for some time about the way information about travel advisories are, are conveyed to Canadians. It's kind of a, a 20th century conveyance, the way it's done now. You have to go out and get it as opposed to it being pushed to Canadians. I think we can improve in the way that that's done so more people can access it. Uh, it's okay, but uh, exercise common sense. L understand what's going on right now and make your decisions accordingly. Make sure that if you're going and you have to go, uh, you take precautions and uh, either that or don't go. Do it over, you know, over the telephone, do it over Skype or meet in a third country where it's safer. The Chinese ambassador came out last week and said there would be repercussions if Canada did not allow Huawei in and ordered Canada to stop trying to recruit international allies. When you hear those threats, do you think there's a risk here to Canadian national security? Yes, absolutely. I've never heard the Chinese make such bold-faced threats before. Uh, they tend to be exercise, you know, a, a, a little more discretion in the way that they, you know, convey this sort of information. This, this is, as I said, they're playing hardball. And I think it needs to be dealt with, uh, with a lot of care. Uh, this is a tough, tough situation now. Every part of the government needs to be involved. I would, if I were the government, I would not stop recruiting allies. He wouldn't have said it if it wasn't having some impact. But again, had we made the decision on the 5G when everybody else did, we wouldn't be the lone person standing out. We would have survived this thing and we would have been part of the wave that was done before. Whenever a decision is delayed, uh, you're going to get yourself into situations like this. And uh, I think the government could have done a lot better uh, had the decision been made with some more alacrity than it was. There's been reports of Canadians being both kidnapped and killed, obviously uh, terrible cases. Uh, another Canadian who's simply missing, we don't know what her fate is. When you look at China and you look at Africa, do you think the Canadians have a sense of how dangerous the world is? Unfortunately, no. Uh, not only Canadians who travel, you know, for pleasure, but Canadians who travel on behalf of their company, as was the case in the tragedy in Burkina Faso this week. Um, you know, a lot more needs to be done in this country. The laws are in place, but I think we could do a lot more in terms of preparing people uh, to travel, you know, for work or for pleasure. You know, training them, exposing them, having an understanding of the environment that they're going to, uh, how to avoid risk, and uh, frankly, in, in some of these cases, how to survive should something go wrong. You know, in the last part of that equation, it's a legal requirement. It's called the, the duty of care. But, uh, you know, under that requirement, there has to be some sort of mitigative action as well. If something should happen, what are you going to do? What's your plan? You know, how do you protect people and how do you get people the heck out of there if something goes wrong? What are Canada's capabilities like in terms of being able to get citizens out? Because I've heard comments from people in the special forces community, in the intelligence community, saying uh, you should better basically hope that you were either American or British or French if you want any help. Uh, otherwise, good luck. Well, I, those people are brave and courageous and talented. Uh, I think what lacks is the uh, courage. It takes a lot of courage to try and rescue people. Sometimes it's not, a, it's not a very good idea to do a rescue. It's always good to negotiate. But, you know, negotiation without the possibility of rescue uh, makes the negotiation stretch out a lot further because there's no risk to the people on the ground. They're, they're safe and secure, uh, and they feel like, you know, Canada is not going to, uh, going to do something dramatic. Um, I think that that should change. We have extremely talented people in our special forces community, but it's a, it's a very tough political decision that in the past uh, the government of Canada has not wanted to make. Uh, I, I think know there in was, some cases we could do better. Th there was a lot of frustration, for example, the situation in the Philippines with the special forces wanting to get involved. They did not get the okay to do that. But when you look around the world, given the fact we don't have the same capabilities as some countries and it is a dangerous place, if you were going to advise people at home where not to go, what would you tell them? Well, look at the government advisory. Uh, you know, Eventel, the company that I work for, uh, provides you information about the risks in each country that you go to and teaches you how to not only avoid the risk, but to survive should something go awry. Uh, I think that there's, there's a lot of advantage to that because avoidance of risk in the country that you're going to is you know, gonna, gonna eliminate 90% of the problems that you have. People go in, especially Canadians, we're such nice people that we go in with our eyes kind of half open 
and we don't understand what's happening around us and not taking appropriate measures to avoid ourselves being the easy target. Uh, frankly, make someone else an easier target than you. Uh, you only have to be the, you know, the, the, the second slowest runner and you'll be fine. Let them catch the slowest. Andy, there's some less sympathetic cases as well, including Canadians who've been detained in Syria because they were fighting for ISIS. Uh, we're hearing reports that there was a Canadian involved in the attack this week, or pardon me, last week in Kenya. What obligation does the Canadian government have to those citizens? And you worked at CSIS and know whether or not they have the ability to monitor these people. Should they be bringing those Canadians home? Well, if it was my way, you'd bring them home and face justice. I mean, very frankly. Uh, I don't think that our legal infrastructure is good enough. Uh, the problem is it's, in its, it's evidence and disclosure. You have to acquire evidence that says this person was fighting, for example, for the Islamic State in Syria and bring that to a Canadian court and it needs to be challenged, which is constitutionally a good thing. But acquiring that intelligence and acquiring it from a source that you're willing to burn is where the challenge comes in. If you have a, a human source who's penetrated you know, a terrorist group, are you going to bring him up and ruin him forever and put his family's life at risk in order to convict one person? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, other jurisdictions uh, in Western countries have, a, have an easier time of presenting evidence into court uh, in a way that protects the source better, uh, Britain being a classic example. Canada's been trying for years and years and years to find a way to, to improve the intelligence to evidence uh, equation, and I don't think we're any better now than we were a decade ago. Those people, uh, some of them right now, there was some information came out on the weekend of a, you know, of a Canadian who... Uh, your uh, news organization actually reported it and did an extraordinarily good job on it, uh, that it looks like he was a person who uh, committed atrocities. Uh, the voices sure sound the same. Uh, what can be done? And that's a big question. That's a question for the Crown, for law enforcement, and, and frankly, for our elected government. Andy Ellis will certainly be asking them about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. That's all the time we have for today. But for more politics from the West Block, please visit our website, thewestblock.ca, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll see you next week. For the West Block, I'm Mercedes Stevenson.